all of you that went down with the choir to sing Friday night down the revival in Shelby. We had a great time. I had uh, seven people saved and, and the Lord blessed and, and uh, we had a great time in the Lord. So appreciate you going. Appreciate you praying. All right, now get me up on this near, brother. Jeremy. One, two. All right, coming on now. First Corinthians chapter number 15. First Corinthians 15, begin reading with verse number one. We're gonna get in the scripture tonight. I want you to hold your Bibles open and I'll ask you to turn to four or five verses as we bring the message. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. Some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Look at that verse again. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And then he said, his grace was bestowed upon me, wasn't in vain. And then the last part of the verse, he said, the grace of God, which is with me. I wanna preach for just a few minutes tonight on the grace of God. Of all the subjects in the Bible and the Word of God, heaven, hell, judgment, eternity, grace to me is the most unfathomable, hardest to grasp subject of all the subjects in the Word of God. I am not qualified, nor am I able to explain, define, or show you what all the grace of God is. But I'm going to try by the help of the Lord. Great men have tried to define the word grace. I'm going to give you a few quotes. Dr. R.E. Neighbor, the great uh, uh, preacher of the Bible, said, Grace is the unmeasurable and unmerited favor of God. Charles Spurgeon, the famous Baptist preacher said, grace is something in God which is at the heart of all his redeeming activities. That means everything God does, grace is in the heart of it. But another preacher said, grace is the pure liberality of God. But I think C.I. Schofield had the best and most well-known definition of grace when he said it like this. He said it is the unmerited, unrecompensed favor of God. That means you can't do nothing to earn it, you don't deserve it, but God gives it to you anyway. Glory to God, that's grace. The word grace, gracious, and graciously appear over 200 times in your King James Bible. Tonight, I wanna to show you five verses of scripture in which we're gonna do a little overview on the word, the grace of God. First of all, let's look at the grace of God in salvation. Take your Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter two, and this is a very, very, very well-known scripture. I'll read just a little bit of it tonight, and it shows you the grace of God in salvation. The grace of God in salvation. It's in Ephesians chapter number two here. And the Bible said here uh, in verse number eight, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. 
Now we'll come back to that in a little bit. The Bible said there, that's the grace of God in salvation. He said, by grace you're saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now just like a lock, if you, let, if you turn the lock on that door over there and close it, it closes by itself and cannot be opened without a key. That's the way we're in. We get in sin and a mess all by ourselves and cannot get out without grace. You can't do it. There's no way that, that you can get out without the grace of God. It, grace is like a rich man giving a million dollars to a poor man. He can't pay for it. He can't earn it. He can't pay him back for it. He's just a total gift. Can I say to you all tonight, our salvation tonight is absolutely the gift of God. God gave it to us. Not a one of us in here tonight uh, merited God's favor. There's not a one of us in here tonight that God looked down and said, now there's a good person right there. I think I'm going to let him into heaven. No, sir. None of us deserved it. I didn't deserve it. The night I got saved when I was 18 years old did not deserve God's mercy and the free gift of God. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, somebody said it like this. They said, uh, if a man works for something and gets paid for it, that's a wage. If he competes for something and gets it, then that's a prize. If he gets an award uh, for service, that would be an award for what he done. But when you can say nothing, do nothing, be nothing, and get it anyway, that's grace. Amen? That's what grace is. They said years ago, this young man uh, went off to Bible college, and this old uh, man and woman raised him on a farm, and this boy, he was raised in it by some good old Christian parents, and they taught him right from wrong all his life, and he loved the Lord, and his mama loved the Lord, and his daddy loved the Lord, and... and uh, he went to school and he's sitting there in seminary class and the professor got up and he was talking to all the boys and he said, I'm gonna give y'all an assignment. And he said, I'm gonna give you a subject to study and then you come back Monday and you're gonna give us a, a, a little essay or a speech on the subject. And that boy's assignment was grace. And he went home that all thought, you'd think that'd be easy. Oh boy, I got it made. I got a good word like grace. And the more he thought about it, he thought, I don't know what grace is. I don't know how to define or give a speech on the word grace. So he went home. He went out there uh, uh, into the house of his mama. And his mama was in there. She'd been making biscuits in the kitchen, you know. And it was an old farmhouse, no air conditioner, nothing. And, and she had the dish rag on that old, old print dress way down to here. And he said, Mama, he said, I got a, I got I got to define grace. How am I going to define grace? Uh, Monday at, uh, at uh, school. And she laid her rag down like that. And she looked at her and she said, Son, the only thing I can tell you, the best way I can do it, is the song by John Newton. And the first verse said, uh, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And he said, Thank you, Mom. I appreciate that. And he said he went out there to the barn and his daddy was out there working in, in the barn and uh, uh, he said, Daddy, he said, I, I gotta define the word grace. And he said, I don't know, I don't know how to I don't know how to do it. Mom helped me a little bit and she told me that song. He said, Son, your mom give you some good advice. And he said, All I can tell you is uh, it was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious, son, did that grace appear. The hour I first believe. He said, thank you, Daddy. I appreciate that. He went into the bedroom there. There's his old grandma sitting there and grandma sitting there in a rocking chair, you know, just like you'd see them on TV on a little house on prayer or something. And he told them what his mom and his daddy had said. He said, Mama, I got to define grace Sunday morning. What am I going to do? And she, she uh, 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 put her glasses on like that. She had her Bible in here and she said, Son, I, I agree with you, Mom and Daddy. And she said, Son, all I can say is through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. His grace has brought me safe thus far. And grace, hallelujah, is gonna lead us on. He said, amen. He went back to school Monday. He got on and the professor called on him and he said, son, can you stand and tell us what the word grace means? That old boy stood up in class that day and he said, I asked my mama and she said, and he quoted the first verse. He asked that I asked my dad 
daddy. And he said, he quoted the second verse. He said, I asked my mama. And she quoted the third verse. And by that time, everybody in the class was crying and tears was coming down their cheeks. And the professor stood up and he said, all I can say is, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began. I'm telling you what can take a bunch of old redneck bunch of sinners like us and put us in the glory land one of these days. It is the grace of God in salvation. I'm telling you, you can't get saved without grace. Everybody is saved by grace. Hallelujah for the grace of God in salvation. I'm glad that night when I hit that altar as an 18 year old, God didn't say, sorry son, I ain't got enough grace for you. I ain't got enough grace for you. He just dumped it out and dumped it out and he's got plenty to dump out tonight if you need grace this evening. Down just a hair, brother. I'm telling you that's the grace of God in salvation. Let me say secondly tonight, the grace of God in demonstration. Take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 11. What do you say? What do you mean, pastor? Look here, Acts chapter number 11 and we'll look at the grace of God in demonstration. Do you know tonight that you can see the grace of God? You sure can. Uh, look at Acts chapter 11 and verse 23. Acts chapter number 11 and verse 23. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them that with purpose of heart they would cleave to the Lord. Isn't that something? That old boy came and he heard about them people getting saved and he come over there and, and, and watch, watch how they done. He saw them get up in the choir and sing. He saw them shaking hands. He saw them giving their offering. He listened to He watched them study the Bible and the Bible said he seen the grace of God. You can see it. That's the grace of God in demonstration. Do you know tonight you can see one of the, one of the greatest most rewarding parts of my job. Some of it's not always fun nor rewarding. Some of it's awful hard. But one of the good parts and the great blessings of my job is when I see somebody get saved and they come in church and, and you know they come in they look pretty rough and they look pretty wild and they'll hit that altar and boy you see them there you know and you look for them the next Sunday and there they come walking in the door and then you look for them the next Sunday and there they come walking in the door and it ain't long you look there and there they come walking in on Sunday night and it ain't long there they come walking in and they look a little different they're dressing a little different they, they got a different look on their face next thing you know they got a Bible and they're over by, and that's one of the greatest joys of being a preacher is to see the grace of God working in somebody's life like that. I'm telling you, there ain't nothing in the world like seeing somebody get saved and change like that, and the grace of God in demonstration work in their lives like that. It is the de grace of God in demonstration. Amen. That's right, brother. Uh, the, the the Bible talks about people getting saved, like the Apostle Paul on on the road to Damascus and when he come saw, and he come started preaching everybody said ain't this that same guy that killed Christians ain't this the same guy that uh, locked him up yep that's him well what in the world got a hold of him I don't know did he get some religious experience did he did he join some cult you know what Paul told him he said it is not I but the grace of God that's in me amen I'm telling you tonight everything I am everything I've got everything I have and everything I ever will be I owe to the grace Grace of God upon my life. I tell you about that uh, long fella. They said long fella can write uh, a poem on a piece of paper and sell it for thousands and thousands of dollars. That's the power of genius. Amen. That's right. Uh, Rockefeller can uh, sign his name on a piece of paper like a check and make it worth one million dollars. That's the power of capital. Uncle Sam can stamp a thing on a piece of gold and make it a twenty dollar gold piece. That's the power of money. A mechanic can take a five hundred a thousand uh, a five uh, thousand dollar car and work on it and replace some parts and have it painted and make a twenty thousand dollar car out of it. That's Skill. An artist can take a piece of canvas and paint on it and make it worth thousands of dollars. That's skill. But God, but God 
can take an old lying, cussing, wife-beating, uh, wife hippie, hopping, pill-popping, liquor-drinking reprobate and turn him into an honest, law-abiding, clean-cut, Bible-writing, uh, reading street preaching deacon and change his life and thank God that's a power of grace. Hallelujah for the grace of God in demonstration. I want to say thirdly tonight, let's look at the thirdly this evening in the grace of God and separation. Take your Bible and turn to Ephesians, uh, and turn to Titus, Titus chapter number two. The book of Titus, way over yonder toward, toward Hebrews in the New Testament. The book of, the little book of Titus here in, in the New Testament here. Let's look at the grace of God, uh, what the Bible says about being in uh, uh, separation. The grace of God in separation. You hear a lot of people talk about Bible separation. Did you know what causes a person to be separated? The grace of God. I hear a lot of people say, well, I don't believe in all that old separation. We're saved by grace. That's true. If you're saved by grace, you know what it'll teach you? Let's read it. Second, or Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Everybody look at it. Titus 2, 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us. What does teach us? Grace teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The grace of God in separation. You know what it'll do for you? Hey, if you ever get the grace of God working in your heart just right, it'll take you out of the mire and put you in the choir. Amen. Nobody won't have to tell you to turn, throw that liquor out. I mean, the grace of God get a hold of you just right. You instinctively know, get rid of the liquor. You instinctively know, tell the truth. You instinctively know, be faithful to your wife. Be faithful to your husband. I'm telling you tonight, I ain't got much confidence in people who say, the grace of God has worked in my life and there's no separation whatsoever. That's the grace of God in separation. Now, soon as you start talking like that, you're going to have somebody say, oh, well, we're not saved by works. We're not saved by works. No, we're not. We're not saved by works. But that same scripture says we're not saved by works. It says we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I'm telling you, we're not saved by works. But if God ever gets a hold of your heart just right, you're going to want to work. There's going to be something in you. There's going to be something in you. Now listen, when the Lord got a hold of me, I wanted to do right. You can fuss at somebody and gripe and tell them to turn that wicked music off and dress right and act right till you're blue in the face. And I'm telling you, if they get that older and their heart gets touched by the grace of God, there's something automatically makes you want to do right. Listen, there's something wrong with somebody that has no desire to do right. I'm telling you, buddy, I ain't always been perfect. I've been a sorry Christian many, many times. But there's never been a moment since I've been saved that there wasn't something down in here wanting me to do right. And when you do wrong, you're miserable. Amen? Ain't that right? Yes, sir, it sure is. I'm telling you, brother, I'm not all I want to be. I'm not all people expect me to be. I'm not all the Lord wants me to be yet. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing, by the grace of God, I sure ain't what I used to be. By his grace. People claim to know the grace of God and stay in Hollywood and make dirty movies and act wicked and take the clothes off. Hey, that ain't the grace of God. The Bible said the grace of God teaches us that did not when I said, well, uh, I'm a Christian, but this is my job. And that you, I, can I say something to you? I'm talking about politics. I'm talking about anything. You cannot separate your job from your religion. It's impossible. If you believe something, it's going to come out where you work, where you go to school. You can't do it. You can't. These politicians say, well, I'm a politician and i got to do my job, but in my personal life, I believe, ah, I, that ain't the way they operated in the Word of God, brother. They said, this is what I believe, and if I pay the price, I pay the price. The grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we 
shall live soberly. Hey, you know it's getting summertime, right? Oh, uh, 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 you, you, you rebellious women in here, you always use some excuse to get to show yourself off. And I have no idea what you're so proud of. Uh, but you're always trying to show yourself off. I'm telling you, brother, the grace of God will teach you to keep it covered up. The grace of God will teach you to walk a straight line. The grace of God will keep you to look, live right, men. It'll help you to be faithful, men. It'll help you to do the serve God, men. The grace of God will help you to do right. Church people ain't supposed to be sitting around full of the devil like lost people are. The grace of God will teach you to live right. Amen. When I first got saved, I remember, I remember uh, when I, I got saved, my hair was down to here. I had an old pair of blue jeans. We dressed up. And you know what? Instinctively, something was inside. I wanted to do better. I wanted to dress. I, I looked pretty, and I remember going to Roses and Marion. And I saved me up a little money. I don't know how much it was, $25, $30, something like that. And I bought me a pair of beige, beige-colored pants and I bought me a little jacket and a tie and I wore a tie to church on Sunday morning. I was bare, I think I was still 18 and maybe just turned, I wore a tie, 19 years old to church and you know why? I wanted to. They didn't tell me I have to. They, uh, I said, you know what? I want to go to church and I want to live. I want to be a good example for the Lord and I, I didn't have to, I wanted to. You say, well, the Bible, I know the Bible don't hush for a minute. Quit listening to demons and listen. You might learn something if you listen to me. There's something inside me that said, I want to represent my Lord. I'm going to the house of God to worship him. I want to look the very best I can. Now, some of y'all, I know how you are. One fellow said, I can't afford them big suits like you got, Brother Danny, and buy a $150 pair of tennis shoes. None of my suits cost $150. I ain't never paid $150 for no suit. And I ain't going to. When I get them, they're two for 99. Or two for 119. Six, and that's a lot for me. I, I mean, I'll go to Burlington Outlet, brother. I got something like that. I, one guy said, he said he had a football jersey that cost about $85. And he said he couldn't afford a shirt and a tie. Uh, yeah, whatever. I'm telling you tonight, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that makes you any more right with God. I'm just saying the grace of God, people, will tell you to be separate, to be different. We shouldn't come to church looking like an M&M and looking like we're on a rap stage somewhere. I know some of y'all sitting there, I feel a little buck, I feel a little kick from something. You going, no, 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 no. Well, I'm telling you, the grace of God will make you want to honor the Lord. Say amen right there. Amen. We're not an Eminem concert here. This is brethren we have met to worship. Amen. President Obama can honor his office and, and, and President Trump can honor his office. I can honor mine like this here tonight. The grace of God in separation. You know what our, our attitude now is? Let's see what we can get by with. Let's be just as much like the world as we can get. And I, I tell you, clothes don't make you right with God. It don't make you right with God, but your, your clothes say a lot about what's in your heart. A lot. If, if pe somebody said people wear on their shirt what's in their heart, man, there's some bad stuff in some people's hearts. Lord, I see shirts out there. You, you hope your kids don't even see them. People wear them and don't even blush. I seen one yesterday. I'm not even going to tell you what it said. This girl, I stopped at the flea market to get some apples on the way home. And the girl came over there and bad stuff. I thought, I can't believe you nut get out here in public uh, with that rote on your shirt. And I'm telling you, half of them claim to be Christians. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the grace of God in separation. Quickly tonight, let me show you 2 Corinthians 12, the grace of God in desperation. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. 2 Corinthians 12. And uh, I'll show you the grace of God in desperation. When you're desperate, my, my, the, where's the grace of God? When you're in trouble, when you're desperate, is he there? It sure is. Second Corinthians 12 and verse 9. He said this, Paul said, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Ladies and gentlemen, the grace of God in 
desperation. When you get desperate. Now, you've heard all your life that about dying grace. You know what I'm talking about. People say, boy, I'll have dying grace. A man come to the preacher one time. He said, preacher, pray for me. He said, I ain't got dying grace. And the preacher said, you ain't dying. You don't need dying grace. Uh, if, if you don't have dying grace tonight, that's a good sign you ain't dying. Shout. You ought to be glad. I, I tell you, if you'll live right and serve God when dying time comes, you'll have dying grace. You don't need dying grace. I don't have the grace to face a roaring lion right now because there ain't one in here. Uh, but if one come in that door, I trust the Lord would give me a uh, lion facing grace. I've been in a few messes in my life and God gave me grace to get through it. Hadn't you? Hadn't you been in some problems? Hadn't you been to the hospital? Hadn't you been in the emergency room? Hadn't you been up at the funeral home with a loved one? Didn't the grace of God show up? That's the grace of God in desperation. The grace of God when you're desperate, when you don't know where to turn, when you don't know what you're going to do, when you don't know how you're going to make it, when you don't know how you're going to pay your bills, when you don't know where your husband's going to be with you or your wife's going to be with you, that's the grace of God in desperation. Glory to God. Hallelujah. As that old preacher said one time, he said, he said, Lord, I'm taking all my good works and throwing them overboard. I'm taking all my bad works and throwing them overboard. And I'm depending entirely on your grace to get me through this. Finally, I'll say this and I'm done. Take your Bible and turn to Ephesians 2 again. The grace of God in glorification. A little study tonight on the grace of God. Ephesians chapter 2, once, one more time. Where it was I mean to go? And I'm going to close. Ephesians 2 and look at verse number 7. Uh, the Bible said that in the ages to come, there's the grace of God in glorification. When we get to heaven, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. When we've been there 10,000 years, God will make us a trophy of grace like Rahab, that the Old Testament. I love that story of Rahab the harlot, just an old harlot. And they've come in, they're going to destroy her city and they're going to destroy her old town. And Rahab the harlot said, please, please, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. What a story. I heard old Larry Winkler preach on that years ago and he titled it A Crimson Center and a Scarlet Thread. And that old girl, Rahab, they told her, they said, look, you've kept the, 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 the guys here and you give them a place to stay. When we come back and destroy this city, you hang that scarlet thread out the window and we'll spare your house. She said, thank you, thank you. I know the Lord's with you guys. I know that your God's the right God. Said, okay, sister, don't you worry about it. He's gonna take care of you. And so they all got their armies together and they come in there, son, and I mean, they run over Jericho like it was a bunch of weeds. They flattened that place out and Joshua hollered at him. He said, don't forget now. Now, to the harlot Rahab, spare her and watch over her. And when they come to her house, they said, stop, boys. Go around this one right here. Don't touch that one. The grace of God got on that right there. A harlot, a prostitute, a, a prostitute in the Bible. She put that scarlet thread out the window. Ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you something tonight? I'm telling you, I deserve hell like Rahab did. I'm just an old sorry good for nothing dog. But I got that scarlet thread hung on my window. That's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've accepted the blood tonight, the blood's over the doorpost, the death angel's gonna pass over your house, the grace of God, brother, in glorification, he's able to take Rahab. She's in heaven tonight. Uh, she's in heaven tonight waiting on us to get there. Thank God, hallelujah. That's God's grace and glorification. That's the old, pre old boy said one time, you've heard this story and I've used it all kinds of different ways. Old guy come out there and he's walking by a baseball field and he's come out here and he's by the outfield fence. The road went around it and there's this poor little old boy out there wiping the sweat like this and he's holding his glove He's sitting out there looking like this, you know, and everything. And he looked up the score, and it was like 15 to nothing. And the man looked at him, and he said, Son, y'all ain't doing too good. Ain't you getting discouraged? And that little boy turned around and said, Nah, we ain't got the bat yet. You know what he meant? He said, Bless God, you wait till we get up there. We're going to knock him out. And I'm going to tell you tonight, the world looks at us like it's 15 to nothing, y'all. The world looks at the church like you're a dying breed. You're out. But I got news for you. 
we ain't, we ain't got our turn to bat yet. <laughs> we gonna get it one day. This old sinner's like us, like, I, like Jimmy, like Brother Fred, like Miss Desi, like me, like all of us here tonight. One day the Lord gonna set us up there on that shelf as trophies of grace and we'll shout forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. They say, a wretch like me, I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind. Now I see. Thank God for his grace. Let's stand tonight by his bow. Miss Desi's coming. We're going to sing it tonight, every head bowed. Every eye closed. Maybe you need a good dose of grace tonight. Maybe you need a dose of grace. Maybe you need to just get in this altar and say, Lord, Lord, I failed you, and I need some grace tonight.